Welcome to the second installment of Collegium Talks, Three Perspectives on Research Ethics, which today will focus on the ethics of research design. My name is Veronica Walker, and I will be your host today. I'm a maritime archaeologist, and I work as a core research fellow at the Collegium. And um, before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is a handshake-free event, so please follow that rule. And uh, we'll just with the current uh, COVID outbreak, uh, I'll remind you that there is this social distancing policy, so please keep that in mind. The talk is divided in two sections with Q&A at the end of each section. The first one will be based on ethical clearance and human dignity. And the second section will focus on data ownership, storage, and, um, and so on. And now just as an introduction, uh, the function of research design is to ensure that the evidence obtained enable us to effectively address the research uh, problem as unambiguously as possible. Designing a good strategy is not only helpful for your project, it is also important to step, uh, it's an important step to convince the review boards to support your work. These, uh, in my own personal experience, a very exciting part of the research as it actually lets your mind roam and think about the possibilities, not only of uh, your topic of research, but also the ramifications that your work may have into uh, larger uh, scopes of the population. But just as we place great care in selecting our theoretical and methodological frameworks, as responsible researchers, we're required to think further ahead about the ethical implications that our project may carry. From my own personal experience, I found that this issue is not straightforward, and that the journey takes you to many gray areas that may be difficult to navigate as a PhD student or as an early career researcher. Today, in this second installment of Collegium Talks on Ethics, we want to discuss these gray areas and raise the difficult questions that we are often faced with as researchers in the social sciences and the humanities. To do this, we have three distinguished speakers. We'll start with Molly Andrews. She's a Jane Atos Erko Professor at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies and Professor of Political Psychology and Co-Director of the Center for Narrative Research at the University of East London. Her books include Lifetimes of Commitment, Aging, Politics, Psychology, Shaping History, Narratives of Political, Political Change, and Narrative Imagination and Everyday Life. She serves as the editorial board of five journals, which are published in four countries, and her publications have appeared in Chinese, Swedish, Spanish, Czech, and German. Second, we have Erika Lofström. She is Professor of Education at the University of Helsinki, Chair of the Review Board for Behavioral and Social Sciences and Humanities, and Vice Chair of the Finnish National Board on Research Integrity. Mm -hmm. Her research interests are related to the teaching and learning of research ethics. Her research area include research ethics and integrity, academic writing and plagiarism, ethics of supervision, academic teacher development, teaching education, teacher identity, and teacher beliefs. She has taught academics extensively, supporting them to develop their teaching competences in educational planning and understanding mm -hmm. of students' learning processes. At the moment, she is teaching student teachers in the Swedish-speaking teacher education programs. And third, we have Pirjo Kristina Virtanen, who is the Assistant Professor of Indigenous Studies at the University of Helsinki. Her current research interests include long-term analysis of environmental diversity in Amazonia, epistemological plurality, and decolonization of the Anthropocene. She has worked in Brazilian Amazonia since 2003. Her publications include numerous monographs, edited books and articles on Amazonian cultural landscapes, indigenous politics and leaderships, human environment interactions, mobility, digital technologies, and youthhood. Virtanen is the author of Indigenous Youth in Brazilian Amazonia, Changing Lived Worlds, and co-editor of Creating Dialogues, Indigenous Perceptions and Changing Forms in leadership of Leadership in Amazonia. Birtanen teaches ethical research in indigenous studies and is a member of the Sami Research Ethical Principles Working Group, which was established in 2008. In addition to her research interests, she has co-authored various indigenous school materials. So welcome to Collegian Talks on Ethics. At this point, I would like to, ask, to start a discussion by asking about your research experiences in relation to research ethics. So could you give us your own views of how thinking about ethics have shaped your research design? We can start with Molly. Okay, um, well, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, for me, actually, um, I think that consideration of ethics runs in every single step of the research project uh, process. And I think that when we are teaching, 
Uh, we often, you know, focus on the formalities and, and the um, ethics review boards that um, when our students, for, I mean, I've, for instance, led a dissertation module for third year undergraduates in the UK, and all of their projects need to get official, you know, stamp of approval. And therefore, the um, focus, uh, if you're not careful, is very much on the technicalities. What do you actually need to do to get this passed? But um, in my own research and what I try to encourage my students to think about is that that's not even the tip of the iceberg. Um, that actually uh, sensitivity towards ethics should actually start in the very moment when you're thinking, what is it that I want to research? When you're thinking about researching one thing, you're also inevitably not going to be researching another thing. When you think about who are we going to talk mm -hmm. into, you're also saying who you're not going to talk to. How in my own work, which tends to be interview-based, um, there's all sorts of questions about who you're accessing, and then, of course, what you are asking, mm -hmm. what you're not asking, how you actually deal with sensitive mm -hmm. topics, and I mean, I could go on. I could go on for <laughs> half an hour here. But every single step, you know, so that you, so that you actually um, are, you realize that it's a highly dynamic situation, and that it's the door isn't closed once you have that data. Even questions of what you consider data, when you turn off the tape recorder and somebody all of a sudden mm -hmm. says something, and you're like, oh. Man. That's the thing I would have really liked you to say when it was on. How do you actually negotiate all that? And then, of course, as your questions will develop, but into the areas of publication, where you do and don't publish, um, who has access to that, et cetera. So in my own sense, I think it is, um, for every project, it's, it's really a game that never ends. Mm -hmm. How about you, Erica? Uh, thank you. First of all, Thank you for inviting me to the panel, and it's very nice to be here with my fellow panelists. Uh, um, my daily life is um, in many ways impregnated with ethics because I serve on different boards and, and um, uh, committees dealing with integrity and ethics. I um, do research on these topics, and I also teach uh, ethics and integrity uh, at different levels to undergraduate students, doctoral students, uh, faculty members. So ethics comes in many ways uh, um, um, in, into my daily life. And um, I think that also influences the way I look at research. I like to think that ethics is part of uh, the way of being a researcher and, and, and carrying out your work. It's not something that you tick off the list at the beginning of your project, but rather you, you live it. And um, this is the idea that I also try to uh, convey to my students uh, whenever I teach ethics and integrity. And what I also try to do is to uh, emphasize ethics as something that's really exciting and stimulating uh, because uh, people might think it's sort of technical thing, just like, mm. like Molly, you mentioned. Mm. But actually, it's a very stimulating decision-making process. And you can get caught into very, very interesting questions as you uh, try to, to uh, not just handle the ethics, but when you try to live the ethics. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to convey this spirit of, of uh, academic challenge to, to, to my students when I, when I teach. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much, Veronica, for this kind invitation to come to this event and uh, tell something from the perspective of indigenous peoples. So I work myself in Amazonia, but I've been also collaborating with some uh, Sami uh, colleagues uh, for some time already and with other uh, indigenous colleagues. And uh, one of the main differences, I would say, um, uh, between research with indigenous people and uh, in many other research settings is that we are not thinking only about the rights of the individuals, because many times the general guidelines 
they talk about the uh, rights and autonomy of uh, human research participants as individuals. Mm -hmm. So when you do research with, uh, with indigenous communities, you dealing, besides dealing with individuals, you're dealing with communities. And indigenous knowledge, it's, uh, uh, oftentimes it's produced and owned collectively. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to think, who, uh, who is the collective in my research? Because of course it's very difficult to say, uh, here are the boundaries of this community. Uh, so the collectives, they can change. It can be a village, it can be a family, it can be a different thing. But that's one of the most uh, important thing uh, for my research setting. And generally, I think that uh, if you do um, ethically sustainable research, it only improves the quality of your research. So if you like really interacting with your interlocutors, if you do research with humans, and I, I think in this session, mm -hmm. this is our focus. So if you do engage with humans, it's important that you, you have this interaction throughout the process. Mm -hmm. And that engagement, uh, it can only improve your own analysis of the results and how they are distributed. Um, what else I would like to say? There are <laughs> quite many things. Um, one uh, other thing maybe I would like to mention is that in indigenous studies, we very often we talk about three R's, and these are respect, reciprocity, and responsibility. Different uh, authors have talked about these, these issues. So respect for cultural norms, cultural protocols. Uh, as Molly already said, that it's really important to think like, what should I study? <laughs> and what kind of questions I can make. So it's really, you have to know the community, you have to know their governance structures as well, yeah. uh, what are maybe the sensitive issues. Yeah. So that's really about the respect. Then about the reciprocity. Uh, it's very important that the research also benefits communities somehow, and it's not only kind of like taking away something for the benefit of science and the science, <laughs> scientific results never serving the communities. So it's really reciprocal uh, relationships, but reciprocal in many other ways, because research is a lifelong commitment. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't end in the, in the end of uh, field study, for instance. Mm -hmm. And responsibility in terms of uh, people, but also the topics that you re research, and also the environment. It's very important that to remember that our research can also have some impacts on the environment. Mm -hmm. And picking up on that concept of um, group um, uh, ownership, let's say, um, I, I was looking at public, I mean, publications, uh, uh, journals, and where to publish my work at some point. And I remember that in one journal, it really struck me that it asked that you had permission from the country to actually publish your material. And I was wondering, what does that even mean? Because like, who is the country? Like, there was no specification. I thought that was very confusing for anyone who wanted to do work anywhere, basically, in the world. So how do you take that? Because, of course, you have the state, but you also have specific mm. groups. So if, I would like to know a little bit of your take on that. <laughs> um. I, I have to say, I, I, I've, I've never encountered that particular thing. Um, and in my case, for instance, I've done studies on um, US kind of hyper-patriotism in the context of the Gulf War in the 1990s. Um, I probably wouldn't have gotten permission from you know, George W. Bush to do that. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. was, it was an engaged piece of research which was also highly critical of the way in which the United States was framing that conflict, I think that would be a highly, highly problematic thing. I mean, a lot of my research, um, although I look in depth at individual lives, they're usually in places of political turmoil, be that in the United States or in the UK or South Africa or former East Germany. Um, I guess I'm, I'm fortunate that I never encountered that particular <laughs> thing. You know, I think, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, um, it's difficult to say exactly what that might mean without knowing the, the, the specific uh, context where it appeared, but um, 
I'm thinking that uh, if, if I look at that from um, the ethics review uh, board kind of perspective, uh, then for me that would be to imply that it's important uh, that to make sure that the researchers know the context and the contextual uh, frameworks, requirements, uh, guidelines, uh, where they are going to do their research. Mm -hmm. so, so I would interpret it from that point of view. And of course, uh, uh, this is something we look into when we get review applications into the ethics review board. Uh, we, we will not, we who sit on the board will not know every possible guideline and every possible context and the, the, the regulations and, and, and things like that because believe me, our researchers do research in every possible part of this world. <laughs> so we need to make sure that the researchers are familiar with their context. So what we can do is that we are probing, asking probing questions that have you considered such and such things, would, would this or that be relevant in that particular context? Are you familiar with the guidelines? Are there specific guidelines? Because not every context has their, or country has their own guidelines. So we would be asking these kind of questions to help uh, the researcher to, to make sure that he or she has the suffici sufficient knowledge needed uh, before going into that particular context mm -hmm. to uh, gather data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do agree that it's very contextual. So the ethical uh, review boards, uh, let's say, positive take on your uh, project uh, is one thing. But then there is the other that is the permits from the, uh, from the for instance, uh, indigenous group, mm -hmm. collective persons uh, that the researcher must obtain. So there are even cases that the researcher might have passed ethical review uh, board or may, may have, for instance in Brazil, you might have the research permit to enter certain indigenous territories, but eventually it's uh, ultimately it's uh, indigenous people themselves who decide with who they want to work with. Uh, and there are in different countries, well, especially uh, in Canada, in New Zealand, there are specific, specific guidelines uh, um, for research dealing with indigenous peoples. And uh, many of these have been um, elaborated in collaboration with uh, indigenous spokespeople. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in Canada, there is a tree council policy statement uh, in which uh, certain paragraphs talk about research with indigenous peoples uh, and Metis people. And um, in, in New, New Zealand, there is a Te Aratika guidelines for the, for the research with Maori people. But uh, interestingly, in Finland or uh, in, uh, in Sweden, Norway, we haven't had uh, common guidelines for research that involves Sami people. So now I've been in this research uh, or working group, actually, that have been designing uh, ethical guidelines for research that is dealing with uh, Sami peoples. And the other members, uh, most of... Most of uh, them are Sami people, uh, Sami scholars, or representatives of Sami institutions. And uh, these guidelines are now prepared to, uh, together with the Finnish advisory board on research integrity, TENC. And uh, what we really want to say with this, these uh, guidelines is that besides uh, taking care that uh, you are really following the so-called general <laughs> ethical guidelines, uh, tank guidelines from uh, 2012 and uh, guidelines uh, on the human uh, participants um, being at the core of your research. And these guidelines are from the 2019. So besides those, we would like to present uh, guidelines for Sami research and really get uh, also bioscientists involved not only uh, people from linguists or dealing with uh, cultural heritage or these kind of uh, issues, but uh, there are um, specific issues uh, when you're dealing with indigenous peoples. And actually, if your research uh, would 
deal with Sami cultural heritage or traditional knowledge. Actually, all people should already get uh, ethical review done with the Sami parliament. And many people don't know that that exists, but actually Sami parliament has their own ethical uh, review board. Okay. That's very interesting. Um, in terms of ethical clearance and declaring conflicts of interest, this is a very technical issue. Um, I would like to know from you, Erika, at the University of Helsinki, when is it required to get an ethical clearance and how do you evaluate if there's a conflict of interest for those PhD students who may be working now or early career scholars who have just arrived to Helsinki? Uh, the situations that require an ethics review or ethical clearance, um, there are different uh, term terminology used um, and those terms might have slightly different connotations, but getting or having, having your research uh, um, evaluated by the um, ethics review board uh, should take place when certain um, things are happening in the research. So, for instance, if there is a, a intervention in the physical integrity of, of the research participants, um, uh, you measure some physical reactions with EEG or something like that. So you, you clip equipment on the person. Uh, or if there is a risk, um, a, a risk that exceeds uh, uh, what you can reasonably be expected to encounter in normal everyday life, uh, if there is a potential of uh, psychological uh, harm, if there is... Um, um, presentation of uh, uh, very strong stimuli in, in the research, like showing film clips of violence or something like this. Uh, so there are specific situations, and they are all outlined in what also uh, you were re referring to, the ethical principles of research with human participants issued by, by TENK, uh, the Finnish National Board on Research Integrity. Uh, so it's all outlined here, and if your research has any of those situations uh, occurring, then you should submit it uh, to an ethics review prior to starting your uh, data collection. Uh, you can also have your uh, research reviewed if the funder asks for it or the journal uh, requires uh, uh, even if, if it doesn't fill those specific criteria for ethics review. I have encountered several, not, not several, but two persons who had actually collected data before they went on to do a PhD. And mm -hmm. so the data was not really part of a previous uh, approval of a research ethics uh, review board. And, and yet they were either intending to use the data or they were actually using the data. Is that legitimate in a way? Well, we have to remember that most research does not need an ethics uh, review. Mm -hmm. So most of the, the, the research going on within social sciences and humanities, behavioral sciences, does not have these specific situations occurring in them. So mm -hmm. if the study doesn't involve those things, then you don't require uh, you are not required to have uh, an ethics review. Because okay. that, that's a very different experience from, for example, I, I did my PhD in the UK and there in my university you actually had, it, mm. it, at any point when you had to talk to a person, you would need to submit an ethics, uh, um, a request to, to be uh, evaluated by an ethics review board. And so they would have to meet and they would have to give the approval. And in my case, it was just interviewing boat builders. Like there was nothing particularly controversial that I could think of, but yet you had to pass on. And I was like, Molly also comes from an Anglo-Saxon uh, experience. So what, what's, what's your... Um, I mean, that's yeah. exactly, I, I was amazed listening. I was, I was waiting for you to say, and then of course, anyone who is talking just to people needs to have it as well. But you didn't go, it, that sounds so much more reasonable in a sense. You know, mm -hmm. in the UK, any research that involves the term as live human subjects mm -hmm. requires an ethical review board. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 
it really then depends. When these other situations are entering into it, the forms can get longer and longer and longer, okay? But you always, I mean, everybody has to have it sort of officially signed off. And sometimes these forms can be very, very elaborate. I've had some PhD students who, and I th actually think um, in, in the case I'm about to say, I think it's really legitimate. This was uh, a wonderful, very talented PhD student who was um, doing research with profoundly handicapped people and their families. So the, in the entire PhD was focused on three individuals and their families. Now the ethics review that had to happen for that was this thick. But it was mm -hmm. fair enough. It I mean it, you know. Um, but other times, you know, you sometimes think it, that it would that a lighter touch would actually be better. And I bump into this a lot because, as I said, I I not only um, lead the modules for d to do dissertations, but I also, you know, lead modules for things called you know life histories, which are always involved with talking to people. So, you know, there's. It's it's ever present. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether that really blocks the system in a way because if you have everyone submitting and it's nothing that's really controversial. On the other hand, of course, you want to protect participants as much as you can. So obviously, having that kind of thorough approach may be positive. I mean, to be honest, I really loved the way that you were saying when I teach this, and I do have to spend quite a lot of time teaching it. I try to get the formality out of the way because, mm -hmm. in fact. What you have to do to get it passed is not so very much. Mm -hmm. And to think about it rather as a way of deepening and making much, much better and more engaged your research. So that if you actually think, well, you know, what are the ethical issues in play here rather than how can I get this form ticked off? Because mm -hmm. really that's like a yeah. seven and a half minute exercise mm -hmm. and you could limit your teaching to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like both of you also, some of the most wonderful, hot, engaged, really, really alive discussions we've had in class mm -hmm. was actually making people realize you know, this, this is actually real. This is what, what mm -hmm. happens when you talk to people who are especially who are different from yourself, right? Mm -hmm. How do you negotiate those tricky waters? Um, what's your responsibility mm -hmm. to them? How long does that endure? All of that is much, much more uh, important, exciting, and complicated than for us, anyway, than those forms ask. Mm -hmm. And very often the questions which come back are, are like, no, you kind of missed the point. The real point is, there's much more complicated waters over here, but you're focusing here on anonymity. Okay, that's one of their favorite ones. Yeah. And, and Perio, you were also uh, mentioned before about uh, working with um, indigenous communities, particularly the case of the Sami. I, I was wondering whether there are any special steps that you have to observe when working with indigenous communities. How do you go about obtaining that um, ethical clearance or uh, that kind of permission that you need to get from indigenous communities? Well, um, maybe it's better I, I talk from my own experience yeah. uh, that I have from Brazil and Amazonia. So for me, it's very important to do uh, and carry out community-based research or collaborative research. I know that last time here in the, this uh, Collegium Talk series, you talked about collaborative research, mm -hmm. but it was more about collaborative, collaborative research with researchers from yeah. other sciences. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, collabor collaborative research means that I'm collaborating with communities and together we think uh, what would be interesting questions to make and what would be interesting uh, methods to mm -hmm. carry out this research. So we together, <laughs> we uh, basically designed a project. Uh, I can present them some ideas and uh, it's really rewarding if they're like, yes, this is exactly what we would like to do, but we didn't know how to put it in this, these words or to look at it from that perspective. And uh, they also bring me lots of uh, good ideas and um, even take concepts. Certain concepts can be used as theoretical mm. uh, tools that can really open new avenues for thinking. Mm -hmm. So they can also take, they be taken to the analy analysis part and to the part where we are disseminating research results. So uh, obtaining the consent from the community, it's uh, not only asking, do you think this research is doable, but it's really planning together 
And that's why when we talk about research ethics, we're talking about a process. It's a long process. It's not something that stands in the beginning of the research and then we might see what is the end yeah. result. But it's really a long-term engagement. Mm -hmm. I think this was... Up. Uh, I, can, can I dwell a bit yeah, on, yeah. Yes, <laughs> on the differences on, on um, ethics review? Mm -hmm. uh, because um, in this country, it's obviously a bit different from other, perhaps mainly Anglo-American uh, contexts, where you always subject your research to ethics review if, if there are human <coughs> participants involved. Um, and, and they might have different procedures in place, like an expedited procedure if it's pretty straightforward and then a full review. Mm -hmm. And that's where, when, when you provide the review board with a pile of <laughs> paper. So depending on the type of research, you have different uh, uh, review procedures. Here in this context, uh, in this country, we have just only one procedure and it's, it's more like this full uh, review, but we mm. don't require this much material. <laughs> Uh, but um, the, may, maybe I can open up a little bit the thinking behind this because um, I think the, the, the way we've organized this infrastructure of ethics review here is that we trust the reviewers to be able to deal with the ethical questions and, and handle the, the ethics and, and, and to, to ask the right questions. Uh, and come up with answers and solutions to those questions. So it's, it's very much based on, on trust. And then when the uh, research designs are ethically demanding, then the board comes in as a kind of a support structure. So that, that's sort of the thinking behind uh, the way in which we have organized mm -hmm. the ethics review in, in Finland. So mm -hmm. I think it might be good to, to open this, this a bit that it's, it's um, strongly based on, on a trust uh, mm -hmm. for, for researchers. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, of course, interesting. what do you want to say? I just think that's really interesting. I think that sounds really refreshing. I think it's almost, um, well, it's very different to um, the uh, context that I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds very refreshing. You even mm -hmm. use the word supportive, which is like, you know, that seems amazing that that that, that a ethics review board is there to support you as opposed to uh, mm -hmm. block you. Uh, can I continue? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, because I've been serving on the board for such a long time, I've obviously had to think about my role and the, the board's role and, and I think we have to think about it as a partnership with the, the researchers. We are mm -hmm. not a, a, a police institution mm -hmm. or a controlling institution looking that are you doing the right thing out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we can do, what we really can do <laughs> is to offer support and maybe sometimes give some suggestions, but many times just asking the right questions yeah, but it feels like sometimes um, it does have to do a little bit of policing because we know that in the past there has been a lot of ethical blunders. So we need to protect people from ourselves. <laughs> That's something that we need to acknowledge. So definitely, like mm -hmm. it, it, it's great that it, it's geared more towards support, and it does feel daunting a little bit in the UK when you have to fill up so many forms. You're concerned that your work may not be approved. And, and that was something in the back of my head when I was actually filling out the forms. It's like, you know, will I get this passed? I mean, is this something that is right or wrong? And so you don't get to feel that gray area. And it's more like I need to tick the box rather than what are the real implications of, of what I'm doing? And of course, like each discipline will have more or less impact, but it's nevertheless important. But it, there's, there's this, this side that we have here in, in the board of, working and obtaining consent from the indigenous communities if you work with them and, and how they work as a group. And, and, and I think that's quite important because when you're talking about uh, respect for human dignity and also uh, obtaining like 
informed consent and making sure that there is a voluntary participation. There's a lot of questions that go around it. And, um, and so most of the time, they're not quite uh, clear cut. And, and it's, it's interesting that in this conversation, it just so happened that it came out in the ethical clearance and not in the second section of the discussion, which was going to be uh, respect for human dignity. And it really shows that it overlaps, because of course, you want to get the ethics review board to pass it. But of course, just as important is to get the approval of the, of the community that you're working with. And um, so um, I was wondering, when you're thinking about um, obtaining this uh, uh, consent, a lot of times in the ethics review board, it is required, at least in the UK, that you get written consent. But I speak with a lot of anthropologists and they all agree that it's very complicated to get like written uh, permission. It really blocks activity. Like the discussion may stop very bluntly. People may not trust what you're gonna do with that written consent form. And so um, oral consent, it's more indicated. So I was wanted to ask you what kind of experience do you have on, on this oral consent versus written consent, mm. and how do you go about it? Well, I'll just tell a little story here. Um, I'll try to keep it short. But um, this research that I started to do in uh, former East Germany in the early 90s, um, I mean, I had had all my methodological cha training uh, in the United States and in the UK. And so I began by thinking, you know, okay, I have these incredible people who are willing to talk to me, and I need to ask them to, you know, sign the consent form. And I tried it one time, and I got, I, all, the interview almost stopped completely. I tried it a second time, and by the third time I thought, I, I'm going to kill this project dead in the water if I keep doing this. The feeling there at that time was, like, what is this? Like, that this was some kind of, you know, Western capitalist mm -hmm. idea of appropriation. It's like, you know, like, who owns those mm -hmm. words? And the feeling, I mean, I basically had a choice. Either I was going to do it that way or not. And in the end, I just said stuff that I'm not going to do it. I really want to do this project. And, I mean, they were, and, and because it was really compromising the atmosphere. Well, I went on, I did those interviews, it was great, until a couple years later, mostly it was fine in terms of my publications and whatever, but a couple years later, I was um, publishing a piece in a quite well-known international referee journal, et cetera. The piece was just about to come out, and somehow one of the mm -hmm. editors got wind of that this had happened, okay? And it, this is also gonna lead to your question of anonymity. Mm -hmm. Because not only did they not wanna sign anything, they also didn't wanna be anonymous. You know, they're political activists. That's their bread and butter, is to be public figures. Mm -hmm. And so I was using their real names. I didn't have signed consent forms. And they almost, they, they said, you can't do this. And I said, well, you know, I have, this is the research. So they said, well, you, you know, what, their suggestion, they, they said either I had to anonymize them mm -hmm. or they would pull the um, article, which to me was really ethically compromised because they did not want to be anonymized. But on the other mm -hmm. hand, I did not want them to pull it. So I made up, you know, sort of equivalent names. I did this whole thing. They weren't even happy with that. They, and, and in the end, this was a compromise that I did not feel so great about, but that I went with because it was so, you know, the time was so short, it literally was there, I, but it's a, it's a decision I made that I still feel uncomfortable about, which is mm -hmm. that I agreed to it, and that piece went out with randomized letters of the alphabet representing their names. And I just thought this really, really compromised the spirit of the exchange that we had had. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, years later, when I've done follow-up uh, interviews with part of that same group. Um, I have now, you know, they've been interacting with the West long enough, and now these things are archived in various places in Germany and in the UK and the US, and so people are more relaxed now about giving their consent, And but I'll never forget that when they had had less interaction with us, um, what it really did to the encounter. Do you want to respond to that? Oh, sure. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. 
according to these guidelines on, on ethics re review, um, the um, consent, it's recommended that uh, researchers ask for written consent, but it also states that uh, according to the, the situation or the contextual uh, frame, you use your, or the researchers should use his or her judgment about the situation. So mm -hmm. I think it essentially boils down to that, that we might have a recommendation on, on this kind of, of matter, but then in the end, you have to know your context and you have to uh, consider the ethical consequences of doing this or that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah, I think it's very important to really talk about risks and benefits and the risks and benefits that the researcher sees might be different than our research interlocutors see them. But it's important that you tell them um, what your research is about, how it will be carried, what kind of uh, research material you plan to, to uh, produce during this research uh, project, um, and then how the consent is given. So. I would go <laughs> to say in the very same line, I would say, as well as was said earlier, that if uh, you ask for written consent, many times, especially if you're dealing with uh, older people, that just uh, brings many suspicions, like what you're going to do yeah. <laughs> with this paper uh, later on. Uh, so for me, the consent, it can be given in different forms. It can be also recorded that somebody is agreeing to participate uh, uh, in your research, or it can be um, filmed in video, for instance. So consent can be given in different forms. But I think it's very important that people know that they are participating in research. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are certain research topics that then you shouldn't tell people that you researching them, such as if you are studying corruption yeah. or some other topics, but then you need the ethical uh, review done in your university, for instance, here in, in Finland. Um, but um, yeah, there are many things that you have to tell to the participants, not only that you are participating in the research, but what is it about, who does it serve? And then it's about the negotiation, discussion, and it's important to listen people, what do they think of your research. Mm. Um, I want to open now the, the floor for questions and answers, and because we're running a little bit behind schedule. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Yes, thank you very much for the extremely interesting discussion. So just perhaps one question in relation to the last comment about how to obtain consent. So sometimes it can be difficult to ask people to sign something. Then you said, well, we could record it or we can film it. Would it not be enough just to say, well, this is my practice and we can trust the researcher that she or he has actually mm -hmm. obtained the consent without necessarily being able, oh yeah, and here's all the recordings mm. in case you want to check me. Or how would, for example, from a review board, how would you mm. see such a practice? Mm. Yeah, for me, for instance, in the communities where uh, I'm working, I'm working there for over 10 years. So they, knew, knew they always know that <laughs> I'm there, uh, even if uh, I'm given an indigenous name and I have very close relationships with many people. They know that I'm a researcher. So many things uh, that might be said in uh, situations that uh, you might think that this is not important now for research. But let's say eating together or something, people might say something that is really crucial for the research. And maybe later on I realized that that was a crucial thing <laughs> for understanding this, uh, this topic. So I think I have their trust, and it's part of their way of uh, educating me as a researcher, that they only tell me things when they think that I'm able to understand, that I shouldn't, for instance, tell this sensitive information uh, in my scientific uh, publications. So I do agree with you that it's very much about, uh, about trust. Mm. 
Yeah. Is there not, should there not, so there's trust between you and the kind of group you are investigating or you're doing research about, but should there not also be trust between you and perhaps a journal editor? Mm. Yeah, but when it comes to publishing it, then, so, but you, you could, perhaps you would not yeah. be able to produce all the paperwork or the recordings, but should there not also be a trust between researcher and the publisher? Right, sorry if I didn't understand your question earlier, but that's a very good, good point. But I think again that this is a different type of relationship because, um, well, of course your, your publication will <laughs> stay uh, for longer time, it has a long life, but that person in the journal uh, might, might change and, and so on. But I think it's very important that the journals, um, well, maybe they don't have to require like these written consents, but some kind of explanations that did you have the consent from the community with who mm. you worked, mm. worked with. I'm thinking that there has been some issues, particularly in anthropology in, in Amazonia of there's, I don't remember his name, I'm pretty sure you know who I'm referring to, who was published. Mm. And, and, and then later some issues came about the ethical practices that he was yeah. uh, undertaking. Yeah. So of course, like journals have a responsibility to make sure that whatever it's happening, it happens uh, in an ethical manner. Mm. Yeah, I comment uh, quickly on that because it's very important uh, to uh, really think of our positions as researchers. Because uh, if we look at the history of science, it has been really top-down sort of setting. Mm -hmm. And for instance, indigenous knowledges uh, have really been uh, suppressed by, by science. Uh, science and academia have said that your knowledges are not valid. Mm -hmm. And so much research has been done uh, without informing indigenous people. So much has been published about them. They don't know where are these archives uh, about the ancestors. So this is the history. This is, this is what has happened. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are many anthropologists as well, uh, anthropologists and many other researchers who are advocating for indigenous issues. And they are important as interpreters, <laughs> interpreters and, and so on. But th th it's very important to situate yourself in this history of academia mm -hmm. and all the impacts it has had for many different peoples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I, I, I may continue from here, I think it's in, there are some really interesting dynamics <laughs> going on here because if we think about why uh, there is this um, general norm of obtaining written consent, it is to ensure the voluntary participation of a person uh, and it's been seen that uh, as you sign, you then that's uh, a kind of an utterance of, of that voluntariness. But at the same time, when you sign a, a, a piece of paper with your name, it becomes a kind of a contractual um, thing, or it, it, it's easily interpreted as a contract, contractual thing between the researcher mm -hmm. and the participant. And breaking a contract is always uh, a no-no. <laughs> you, you don't break a contract. Mm -hmm. So um, when, when you think about it from this light, I think it, it does become a bit problematic because we have to keep in mind that research participants always have the right to uh, withdraw from yeah, the I research. I was thinking about that, yeah. And so there are interesting dynamics coming along as we try to protect the research participant, but in the end, we are probably achieving sometimes something else. Mm -hmm. can, can I say something yeah, yeah. on that? Um, I think that that is such an important uh, comment, and I think that even just the ritual of presenting the paper as if you are explaining, as if you have really actual knowledge rather than a hope or a wish that I will not cause you harm by you being in my research and I will do the best I can. But when we sort of uh, do more than that and, and say that we will not cause them harm, okay, um, as if we know what will happen to their words once those words are out in the public domain, 
that is really problematic. And I think mm -hmm. that actually when people give their consent, it's very hard for them to know what they are consenting to. Yeah. And they, they, I mean, there are so many different levels mm -hmm. of that. And I think that um, one of the, uh, just to um, give a name of a publication here, it's really wonderful, uh, Yazir Henry, uh, who was a former combatant in South Africa, and um, he wrote an article about his experience of giving testimony in front of the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And he, his words, and he had given consent, for those words to, you know, be in the public domain. He, did, he never, ever, ever for a million years thought that that meant that he would literally see billboards mm -hmm. with his name and the most painful experiences of his life mm -hmm. splattered on these billboards or used as the topic of, you know, award-winning mm -hmm. novels about the TRC or whatever. And this is, you know, Technically, he had given his permission, but he had never, he said that though his experience of that, of seeing his words in these unanticipated mm. places and the use that was made of those words mm. was far more wounding mm. than in fact the really traumatic experiences mm. that he was recounting in front of the TRC. Mm. Now that gives us as researchers, it should give us real pause mm. because we are, I think, even with the best of intentions, we often come very close to or indeed make false promises. Mm. We cannot actually guarantee that people will not be hurt, harmed, or whatever by their engagement with our research. I think it's much more realistic mm. to say, join me in this kind of risky journey. And this is why mm. it's kind of hopefully worthwhile for you to do so, because these are the kinds of things I'm hoping to learn, and are these worthwhile mm -hmm. f for you and for us in terms of that journey? But I think to go any further and making, you know, sort of claims that uh, even, I mean, when you look at whatever the official ethics of the BSA, the British Sociological Association, you cannot possibly mm -hmm. put your hand on your heart and say, and, and, and say you know what you're doing there. We mm -hmm. just, it's like being, saying I can look into this crystal ball and I know what's going to happen. Mm. I don't think we can. Mm. So I think that's unrealistic. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to say that um, people, they really can refu refuse at any time of the research to participate. And even if they had given the, the, <laughs> the consent, it might be that uh, after they have passed away, their children or relatives might decide mm. that actually we shouldn't uh, have this as a public information and we should do certain restrictions, for instance, to the archives. This has happened uh, many cases because of political situation or some other <laughs> social situation. That's what I wanted to add here. Mm. Are there a question? Hi, thank you. Um, I mean, it seems to me a lot of this is also about the role of the researcher in what they negotiate with their publishers. Because once you publish a piece and you've consented to that contract with the publisher, mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of control over what happens to it. And so I'm wondering, is there a discussion in your fields about you know, the downstream uses of your work once it's out there? You can't, you can't grab it back once it's... And so maybe there should be a movement among academics to start coming up with guidelines for how you negotiate with publishers. Mm -hmm. Y yes, but I sorry I didn't sorry I didn't mean to jump in Go there. Ahead. Um, I think that um, that first of all, once something is out there, it is out there. I mean, you can't you can't you know if, let's say they make whatever ten thousand copies of your book or whatever. I mean, they're out there, um, and so again, I think the important thing is to be clear and to be transparent about what you can and cannot promise. And I think that if somebody in my work, for instance, somebody who has engaged in an interview with me, and I do spend a lot of time negotiating with people afterwards, after we've spoken, looking at transcripts, looking at publications, whatever. But let's say I've done all of that checking back. Once it's out there, it is, it is 
often hard to predict what are unintended consequences. Okay, so people's words can be used against them in ways that I, as a researcher, and they, as a speaker, might not have even imagined. Okay, and I know some pretty horrific stories where people's stories have really been used against them. And, um, and it's highly problematic for the kind of work that I do because I spend hours and hours talking with people and therefore, uh, you know, and I think context is everything, but you're not, you're not gonna put a passage this long in a book, right? So you're choosing something and usually the person has agreed to it, but it's very hard. I don't think there is a way to guard against it. I think you have to be realistic, as I said, and say there are risks involved with mm -hmm. this. Yeah, I think as a researcher, so we have very uh, big responsibility, and it really goes on checking what gets published. Because, for instance, uh, the experiences I have with some co co uh, copy editors or editors of some books, sometimes they change your words while, <laughs> while they uh, think that they're doing a good job. For instance, I was once speaking about uh, indigenous youth in Amazonia, but when I saw this text published, it was turned into uh, youth in a less developed region or something like this. And I was like outraged at how I, I would never say something like that. But I realized that it had been uh, changed, but I, I didn't see it. There was no any uh, <laughs> track changes used or any, any similar thing. And the other thing, uh, but I can't really control it, is, for instance, how things are written about my research. So when uh, something interesting comes out, for instance, I work uh, with archaeologists, so there have been some uh, pieces of news about our research and how uh, this archaeological research has shown that in Amazonia have been already in uh, pre-colonial time, uh, large civilizations, but when I see images in those pieces of news, there are such indigenous groups from completely other place of Amazonia that has nothing to do with this piece of news and very, very exoticized um, like stereotypes of Amazonian indigenous groups. And uh, so we should be all the time careful what's happening, but in these kind of cases, for instance, I. I, in that case, when I saw these uh, photographs used in these pieces of news, I contacted the media. But you know that this continue circulating in, in internet mm -hmm. anyways. Yeah. Erika, you wanted to talk? Uh, yeah, I wanted to relate back to Molly, your example from, from your research in, in Eastern Germany and, um, and the risks uh, and, 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 and possibilities of uh, harm coming to the research participants because they are exposing their identity. Um, and um, I can really feel for, <laughs> for, for your pain in that situation. And I think here we have the situation where we kind of, as researchers, uh, we're trying to fulfill two conflicting principles or, or values at the same time. So we want to we want to respect, show respect to, to our research participants, and we can do that by, by, by respecting their wishes. So if they want to be recognized by their name, uh, then that, that's a way to, to, to show respect. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we have the, the, the obligation to protect them. So here we are trying to balance these two values at the same time, and, and, and Sometimes you, you, you can't just equally fulfill both mm. value, but you kind of have to put one value over mm. the other. And, and often the value that it, uh, ex exceeds the other is, is uh, protecting from risk and, and protecting from what might happen after the research is, is published, if the research participants are presented there by, by their names. Uh, because we cannot always foresee what risk might come to them, then we refrain from publishing those names in order to protect. But at the same time, we compromise that value of, of respecting our participants. Yeah. So I think th this, 
there are, again, these interesting dynamics uh, going on that requires really careful ethical uh, analysis. Can I, can I just, um, yep. just one quick thing on that? So I remember back in many decades ago for my PhD, um, I actually had to make the names anonymous I, for, for, that, for, that, for me to be able to use that data. But then when I actually published a book on it, I didn't have to. And so I went back to the research participants and I said, you can choose any name, including your own. And all of them chose their own name. And this was a book which, I mean, it still is out there, actually. It was republished and stuff. I mean, these people were... But it was interesting because I had to do the thing by the university's guidelines. But then, mm -hmm. then I, I, I almost... I felt much better when I could actually make the thing that had the name by which they want it to be known. On the other hand, it was quite fun when they actually were choosing the names, like, oh, you know, I always wished I had been called, <laughs> you know, whatever. And um, so it was kind of interesting, a conversation about names and all that. My experience has been similar. Like, I wanted to show respect to the boat builder I spoke with, and I wanted to make him visible, because I always get this perception that, like, we go in, take all the data, then we leave, but we don't recognize their, their knowledge, their contribution to the work. And then I, I sent the article to a friend of mine who lives in Australia, and she was like, oh, you have to anonymize him. And I, and I, was, think, I, was, con I was very conflicted, because of course I didn't want to break any ethical rules, but on the other hand, I, th I saw no reason why his name shouldn't be recognized as the person who provided me with the knowledge that I was seeking. So I do, I do Could get... Could you ask him? At the time, no, because yeah, no, I couldn't, I couldn't ask yeah. him. No, yeah, I, it was because I'm an archaeologist. I don't ah. tend to work with live people, so oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was, it was, it was a learn on you the go a kind of thing. Board. Yes, yeah. okay. yes, but I mean, this, this, this does tie it quite nicely into the second topic that we wanted to discuss, which is storage of data, of course, and then uh, ownership. And if we focus on storage of data or the use of the data, and um, we know that um, current ethical guidelines usually agree, but that the data should be anonymized. But of course, um, as Erica was pointing out, there's this issue of whether you want to anonymize it, people who want to be visible, should they have the right to be visible? But of course, when you do data collection, you don't know the ramifications of what's going to happen. And, and to put very um, dark examples of what has happened when people didn't think about the ramifications of their data collection, we have the example of the Holocaust in the Netherlands because they had a very good system of uh, census. Uh, the Jews were very easily identified and therefore they, they, they suffered uh, a lot of deaths. And this happened as well as the, in the Rwandan genocide with ID cards that identify them with certain ethnicities. So there's always a risk involved. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, there's no, like, although these examples are from state-led surveys, there's no reason why our data should not be uh, scrutinized and thought of in terms of what could happen to people if they're not properly anonymized. And, and, and so I, was, uh, I, I, I thought it would be interesting to discuss here how uh, researchers can guarantee that the data collection is done with the utmost care and how does the University of Helsinki allows researchers to anonymize the data of, their, uh, of uh, the participants of any kind of uh, research? Who wants to oh, take? You want, yeah, well, you want mm -hmm. uh, well, I can't say about the University no. of Helsinki. Erica? <laughs> uh, so, uh, what, what's, can you repeat the, the well, question? Well, the question is more like, uh, how do you guarantee in terms of storage? Because, of course, now we're working with uh, massive yeah. data collection. Okay. So yeah. how do we guarantee that we can, we can anonymize the data properly? Like, uh, what kind of uh, um, guidelines are there in the University of Helsinki specifically, since we are working here to ensure okay. that, that uh, yeah. anonymity has happened? And what kind of recommendations you would have for people who are now doing research design, who are early career scholars, what kind of questions they need to ask when they're uh, designing their, their research project in terms of ensuring the safety of their participants. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of uh, times the, re the research data actually is not anonymous in the real 
true sense of the wor mm -hmm. word. Uh, it's more uh, pseudonymized, and this means that uh, you've taken away names or direct identifiers. But when you have enough information of a person and you combine those different bits and pieces of information, the person might be traceable. And uh, I think in the current situation uh, where we have uh, uh, lots of data accumulated of, of people, it's in the end who can really assure that nobody would be able to, to trace somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I also think that this question is, is becoming more and more uh, important because of uh, all the genetic data that is accumulated of people, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much an identifier, <laughs> direct mm -hmm. identifier. So. Uh, also, the ways of combining data from different databases are becoming more sophisticated. And I think we don't even know where this development is leading us mm -hmm. uh, with all um, developments within artificial intelligence. So uh, how to guarantee anonymity? I am not sure we can do that. Um. I, I guess what I want to say is um, I really want to challenge the question, okay? And it probably is already clear from what I said before that um, I think the question of anonymity is an important one, but it should be approached in a highly differentiated way, a highly sensitive way. And I know that this presumption of the importance of anonymity underlines many of our formal and informal ideas of what constitutes research ethics. But I actually think that that is itself ethically very compromised for the reasons that I kind of already indicated earlier. Um, I, I think that it is very important to be sensitive. Uh, you need to also think what is, the, what is the actual research, what's it for, who's participating, and you need to think about the risks, etc. And as we've already said, you need to be really careful about making sure that you are building in not only your own assumptions, mm -hmm. but your participants' discussions in this. So in my work, actually, to be honest, it's almost in the opposite direction. So a lot of stuff, different projects that I have worked on, are not only not anonymized, they are in historical archives, okay? And uh, very much with, you know, these person's names and biographies and tapes and photographs and, and then photographs taken again. Da -da. And that is with their full consent. If at any time they wanted to withdraw any or all of that material, fine. That's a completely negotiated thing. But the assumption that they would not want to be known. I mean, one person, because I grew into this position, because I was also myself, as a scholar, socialized into this idea that anonymity is important. And especially because I am often interviewing political activists, so people who really are public figures, and, and the work that they are doing is public engagement. and. They were like, you mean, you want me to have done all this work and had all these conversations with you, and all of a sudden, those ideas and those passions and those compromises, I mean, they're not mine all of a sudden? No, I'd like my name with that, please. Mm -hmm. You know, so these are the kind of conversations that I've tended to have. I'm not saying that anonymity isn't important. I think it can be, and I think that this is, should also be part of the ongoing conversations mm -hmm that we have with people who participate in our mm. research. Mm. What's your take, Piri? Yeah, I think University of Helsinki, it has improved uh, in this regard quite a bit because they have quite good data management services these mm. days because we really need a data management plan, for instance, uh, so attachment to Academia Finland uh, yeah. applications and so on, and they really mm. give uh, good service in these questions. But when we talk about the anonymity of our research participants, I would like to add a little bit different perspective. Uh, because we have talked about safety of the research interlocutors. But for instance, in the Global South, I know that many researchers 
are, I think, as much as they are worried yes. about the safety of their uh, research participants, they are worried about their own safety, so the safety of the researcher. Because many of the topics uh, might deal with very sensitive issues, and the researcher can be identified that this person is working here and there with this and that community, so it can be really uh, risky business for, for these researchers, especially in, I would say, in Latin America. I know many countries where researchers suffer for, they, for their own safety, mm -hmm. even if they would be really welcomed and invited by the communities to, to, do, to, to do research. But about the anonymity, uh, because here we also we have to remember that it's important that we don't uh, burden certain small groups of people, let's say indigenous people or minorities or religious groups by research, because it's important to work with the existing data. There's loads of data that could be reused, so it's important that they mm. are archived and it can be reused. But so here it's really difficult to to know what sort of restrictions should be created. But I think always the negotiation with the communities is the key to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. Radhika, you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to continue a little bit on, on this promise of anonymity because we are trained that we should always uh, make sure that uh, participants' uh, identities are, are anonymous. So again, here, this is again another of those situations where you are balancing different values against each other. So we might easily uh, be in the situation as researchers where we promise our participants that yes, your data, it, you, you will be anonymous in, in, in my research. Everything about you will be anonymous uh, because we're trained to, to make this promise. But then again, with the technology and, 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 and the way that maybe in the future it's possible to identify people by putting this and that data together, uh, we might not actually be able to live up to that promise. Uh, so maybe then it's better to say that I will do my best uh, to protect your identity, uh, but I cannot promise full anonymity. So again, here, this requirement to protect, but then again, the, the, the value of honesty mm -hmm. are, are, are put sort mm -hmm. of uh, against each other, and, and, and you have to make the consideration that how, how do I navigate in, in this situation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this also ties in with the discussion that uh, Peri was mentioning in you about ownership of the data, like who owns the data and what can happen to the data when it has been collected and how is it even created? Because of course we've got uh, different questions, different interests and different epistemologies of how you get to the knowledge that you want to, to get to. So I was wondering how you went about in, in negotiating the discussion on ownership in your own respective fields. Well, in, in my research, I've been uh, co-authoring quite a lot. Uh, I could add names of many people as authors to many of my uh, research papers, but we have uh, decided that those who are in academia, because some uh, of the community members during these years, they have, uh, they have studied in universities, and so they, they uh, become researchers. <laughs> um, in these research projects that are carried out in the communities, uh, in which I'm involved my, myself, I really like that it's good to have indigenous researchers as, a, as a collaborators who have also academic background, so they, they may, may have a different uh, view to the research process than the community members who might not know how academia works. Uh, but the ownership uh, is really negotiated with the community, and very often community wants to have copies uh, of, the, uh, of the data. So again, it's important to know what they will be used for in the future. Mm -hmm. But for instance, uh, communities with who I work, uh, they 
They have used loads of my images for different, uh, different things, for their school books and so on. So those <laughs> materials, they had a different life than I thought uh, uh, initially. And they also publishing in different forms is important. So sometimes we even write uh, for non-academic audience together. We mm. really inform about mm. things, what are happening. So ownership is shared but it's very much negotiated always in, in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Molly? Um, here I think I, uh, the word ownership it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I, I, wouldn't, I, I certainly don't feel like I own the words that you know, are produced, um, but I guess what I would say is, again, emphasizing the particularities of the kind of research that I do, um, I have always thought it was really important to archive uh, all the materials of projects that I've been involved with. I have always uh, talked in a lot of detail with the people involved in my studies about what level of access they were comfortable with. Now, again, because of the kind of people they were, usually they're, they want pretty high access uh, for the public. But this is also because of my own I want to say my own political stance about scholarship. I think that you know our work should generally, when possible, when not too sensitive, should actually be available uh, to the public for for all sorts of different reasons. On the other hand, I do get a little bit uh, what can I say protective, nervous, thinking about mm -hmm. somebody delving into these uh, transcripts. I want to say with the wrong intentions, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's always like a, a um, balancing there, which is, which is kind of hard. But I do, what, I've, what I have always done is, is um, archive the material and put, I have actually put some restrictions on, um, so I, I don't actually make it just fully open. Um, and usually there's at least something about a 25 year, you know, gap mm -hmm. for it to be completely open, but even then, um, before then, you want it open to the public. So there's all sorts of levels of negotiation. The other thing I would say in terms of ownership is, again, I think your point about it's not, it's not just the academic publications or whatever, it's what happens with the public engagements, the civic engagements, which ultimately I think a lot of people who are involved in my kind of research uh, who, who are engaged with my projects are most mm -hmm. interested in. So what happens in the public domain when there's exhibitions, when there's this or that? And that I really take a lot of care with because I think that, you know, like I had somebody, for instance, uh, approach me at, um, that they wanted to use just the photographic images of these people. Uh, this was for the 25th anniversary of the opening of the Berlin Wall. I thought this was highly problematic. It's like making you know, sort of heroes out of these activists, which was so contrary to their own sense of the political work mm. they did. And so I actually said no. I said, you can't have the images without their words. If you don't want the words, mm. then, then let's not do it. And that, I mean, it, I had to fight pretty hard for that. And in the end, we found ways to make their, because they would have hated to, and actually this was in Berlin, so that would have even been worse, mm -hmm. right? So there would have been some, because the photographs were gorgeous, but they just wanted some photographic mm -hmm. exhibition, and it's not just an, an artistic encounter, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is, no, you can't have those yeah. without the reason why those pictures were taken. So it's, it's always, it's pretty fuzzy, I guess. Hmm. Eric? Um. I think this, again, your example, Molly, shows how important it, it is to understand the, the, the context where that data emanates from. And, and maybe, maybe uh, looking at it or separating between legal ownership and moral ownership can, can be one um, helpful strategy. Uh, and also, when considering the moral ownership, uh, uh, is it yours as a researcher? Is it the participants or the participants' communities? Or uh, university. Or, mm -hmm. or university or future researchers. Molly, you talk about, about archives. So 
or an archiving data. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe sort of picking this concept apart and, 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 and looking at these different perspectives might be helpful in trying to sort of uh, uh, come up with a, a solution that would be mm -hmm. uh, ethically sustainable. Mm. I think, Peter, you were touch touching on the point of, I think it's a specific case from Australia where an anthropologist conducted research on an indigenous community and he agreed with them that he would not share the data. And so there's a, um, there's a, um, there's a ban in place so that you can't access the data, but the uh, heirs of the people of whom the data was collected from, they now want access because it's the only way they can access their own past. And so they're uh, engaged mm -hmm. in a legal battle now there, particularly because, right. of course, like it was done with the best of intentions, but now they're locked out of their own knowledge in, yeah. in terms of the inheritors. Yeah, I'm sure there are um, many similar examples. Mm. I think the key is here to think how the research returns to communities and it can mm. return in different ways mm -hmm. because not necessarily the research data <laughs> serves communities in the ways as it might preserve uh, the science. It can be still beneficial for the communities. Uh, but it's important to think how everything returns to the community and uh, if even the copies of data uh, returns, uh, it's important to uh, ensure that the communities have conditions to take care of those archives. In some cases, some indigenous peoples, therefore, that they don't have those conditions. They want to give the archives to some closest institution that is taking care of that archive. It might be very far for them. It might be very difficult to access it. Mm -hmm. But so there are other means of archiving as well. There are digital archives. Mm -hmm. There are many different ways how to, how to share <laughs> the ownership uh, of, uh, of research, research project. Mm. But this, I think, when we talk about the return of the research, it's about the reciprocal relationships again. Mm -hmm. Like we are exchanging our knowledges and we, then we really know what, what, <laughs> what was said about us. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a, another step to take and after, after that, that the communities can take together with the researchers and plan uh, or plan other research projects with other researchers. So it's really important that the research serves, serves the communities and, mm -hmm. and their objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, we're running a little bit late on time, so I would like to open now the, the floor for questions, if you have any. No questions? Uh, I know that you probably have a lot of questions between yourselves, so if you want to go ahead and ask questions. Yeah, I just would like to comment because it came to my mind now that many times when we talk about this reciprocal relationship and, and a research uh, project being uh, beneficial for the people who you carry out the research with, um, I think it's important to understand that there are also so-called basic research and many times we don't know how this particular research might be beneficial in the long run. It might be something related to, for instance, uh, language documentation or some other, uh, other topics that you're dealing with, and you don't really see the pe immediate benefit in the next few years, but it might come in, uh, in the longer run. Yeah. So I think research, uh, it can be beneficial in many different ways. Also mm. in terms of theory, if you theorize something in a, from very a uh, new uncle, for instance, if you're dealing with the sustainability issues, or mm. I could <laughs> name many uh, issues, of, uh, for instance, um, as related to climate change or climate emergency, theories, mm. new ways of thinking can be really mm. beneficial mm. at grassroots mm. level. Can, can I say something? I mean, so I, I agree with that, and I think that it really is important to ask if and how something is beneficial to the people who are participating in your research. But I also think that there has grown up a very, a pretty dominant narrative about empowerment, that somehow, you know, we are giving, let's use that phrase, voice to the voiceless. Mm -hmm. And there is this myth of empowerment. I say myth, it might be, 
but it also might not be. Mm -hmm. And I think that oftentimes researchers, we tell ourselves an incredibly self-congratulatory, emancipatory tale mm -hmm. where we are actually opening the doors mm -hmm. here and uh, you know, I'm not saying, and, and this isn't at all mm. what you're saying, but I, I, at all, but what I do think is that, and I'll be, I'm going to sound very cynical here, but there's one person who that research really definitely benefits, and mm. that's me, mm -hmm. okay? That's the basis of my scholarship, of my publications, of my promotions, mm. etc. And I try to put that right in my face and say, you need to be realistic about mm. that. Uh, and to hope, in the meantime, that you actually are doing something to, whatever, to, mm. to, to improve the situation of the people that you are speaking with. But it's also important to really put your mm. own narrative about what you're doing, your own often yeah. overly self-satisfied yeah. narrative about that in check. Yeah. Because we're doing that because that's our scholarship, okay? And so I kind of, I think it's both ways. And keeping that double-edged thing in, right in your mm -hmm. forefront of your mind, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think that boils down to honesty and, you know, facing yourself as a researcher, and, and, and that's where the ethics start from. Mm -hmm. So honesty as a, as a value, I, I, I'd mm -hmm. say, is the very starting point for, for much of the ethics in research. And then you can ask those questions from yourself and, and how does this research that I'm doing, does it benefit? How does it benefit? At what time perspective might it benefit? And then we might get those answers. But, uh, but if we are not honest to, to ourselves, then what's the point really of what we are doing because aren't we, isn't our mission to seek the truth? So whatever well, that is, <laughs> but that's maybe another philosophical <laughs> discussion. Yeah, but I think it is a very good point because if we really want to be realistic, what happens very often is that we, as researchers, we talk to the researchers of our own fields the journals that we uh, read are only read by the scholars of our own fields. There's so much happening in different fields and we don't even have a proper dialogue, like in re really interdisciplinary way. Uh, so we are already very limited uh, in academia, <laughs> in our own thinking. I'm not talking about people in this panel, neither here who are pr present in this hall today, but uh, generally, uh, we, we are very limited in our own concepts and methods and theories. Uh, our education <laughs> uh, these days uh, is maybe given us uh, very limited, uh, limited uh, tools for, for thinking. And the other thing is that uh, academia is only one uh, very small uh, part of the society if we think that we can really change something, there are bigger <laughs> forces that might be a business sector or some transnational uh, actors. So I'm not saying that we as researchers, we can change the, <laughs> can change the world, but I, I, I know that there is this, that you can be cynical, um, but I, of course, I want to be positive and, and uh, I think doing ethically sustainable research can be a key for better research and having some more impacts in the so at the societal level. And I think that with that positive note, <laughs> we have to um, close mm. the event. Uh, the third talk of the series will be the next March 26, hopefully, where Carolina Stell will lead a discussion on the ethics of impact with Mia Halmet Domisari, Janne Hukkinen, and Kristila Rollin. And uh, you'll get more updates if you follow us on, on, on Facebook for this event. And I want to thank the speakers for their very useful and very good in insights on the uh, research of ethics design. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.